Okay, hey, this is Stefan Kinsella, Kinsella on Liberty. This is another one of my episodes where someone asked to talk to me about something, and I said yes if I can record it in case there's anything of interest to listeners. So this is Kent Wellington, who briefly informed me he's not exactly a libertarian, but just has some questions. I don't really know what you want to talk about, but Kent, why don't you introduce yourself, however you want to do it, and then we can start. Hey there, my name is Kent Wellington, and... Uh... I just uh, have been very anti-IP since I was a child, really. And uh, when I realized that uh, Mr. Kinsella, Kinsella was uh, the one who wrote one of my favorite books against IP, um, I was really, uh, yeah, taken aback. And uh, then I was like, wow, you know, I should reach out to him and just uh, try to have a conversation with him because... Um, I've sort of been in the, uh, what do you say? Uh, I've just been, you know, uh, up in the towers on these topics for a long time, like my whole life. And I've never, I, I never really get to talk about these topics with anybody one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, I just saw his, uh, that he puts his email out there. So I was like, I'll just email him, see if he'll, he's willing to talk to me for even a minute. So um, yeah, that's what we're doing right now. And uh, I have uh, I have some very uh, different takes, I guess. Some some I, what I think are some novel takes, but maybe aren't. And I'd love to, you know, be proven wrong. Or I just wanted to throw some things at you um, regarding um, contracts, IP, anarchism, a few different things. Uh, mainly, I guess I guess my uh, my uh, main hypothesis is um, so I I'm very uh, I'm very <laughs> into the um, quotes uh, from Jesus on oaths, and I believe that um, without so I think that oaths are the key social mechanism of the state do you do you what do you think about that what do you are are, are O's not the key social mechanism of the state oaths o-a-t-h yes oaths yeah uh i'm not sure i know what that means what, what, what do you mean so oaths are you know if you want to become a doctor in the u.s at least uh a professionally recognized doctor, you you have to take the Hippocratic Oath, right? Others, so our, our whole professional society is filled with oaths, which are really these sort of mystical activities, yet uh, our secular world is filled with these oaths. To, to become a uh, lawyer, you need to take the bar oath. To um, become a politician, you know, you need to swear in. You need to take an oath of office. Um, there's there's a bajillion oaths uh, you need to take uh, in modern society uh, if you want to partake in modern society. And so Jesus, and I'm not necessarily getting religious here. You, you could just say that um, in one of the most popular books in the world, which, you know, the Bible is, well, the most pop, the biggest guy, the, the most important guy in the book, in the New Testament, Jesus, in his biggest speech, the Sermon on the Mount, he says, take no oaths at all. Instead, just say yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. So my interpretation of that is that um, anything beyond you giving your word, like if I invite you to my birthday party and, you know, I give you the, I say, hey, can you come to my birthday party? You can say yes or no. Um, or you can say maybe too. Uh, but anything beyond that, if I say like, hey, well, will you swear on it? Or hey, will you sign this contract? Or hey, will you blah, 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 blah. To me, uh, that's opening the door. That's what, exactly what Jesus is saying. It's opening the door for bad things to happen. And to me, it's what is the root cause of it's the, uh, it's the potential root cause of like all the bad things that happen with the state. 
because so like Jesus says, anything beyond this, anything beyond like a verbal yes or no, um, it basically invokes, uh, as I mentioned to you in an email, I'm also, in, I, I, so are you have you heard of uh, Parnell's Iron Law of Bureaucracy? Uh, vaguely, but I don't, I don't really remember. So he, um, so the law states that um, in any organization, uh, over time, uh, the bureaucracy will overtake the main uh, organizational uh, object or mission. So when you uh, swear an oath um, or you have a contract or something, there's always a third party that um, basically you're acknowledging uh, an elevated third party that is at least uh, on a long enough time span is going to corrupt things. And uh, so to me, <clears throat> IP, so if, so IP is a form of a contract. I mean, it's a contract. If I, if I have, you know, my, I mean, I just see the whole entire concept of IP as, as BS, but um, let's say you now I have my little idea, whether it's a drawing, let's say it's a drawing, then I, I'm, I just go to the government and I, we have a contract, you could call it an oath, um, where they're going to protect my work, they're going to monopolize my work. Um, so to me, to me, uh, Jesus, like, I'm like, uh, when I, when I realized that Jesus said this, cause I had never heard that in a church. Like I grew up in church. I'd never heard that, heard that before, heard him say that to me, it's like, Jesus is like the ultimate, you know, uh, I, he, he's, he's an anarchist in this, in a sense, but he's also of course a total statist monarchist because he advocates for the kingdom of heaven and all these, you know, royal terms and things. But um, I was really blown away that he just like prescribes so clearly this um, this way to. Mm -hmm. Well, so I think we would need a definition of oath. I mean, because you're using it by examples, and you're even including. I, I think it's a stretch to include it to to call the, the IP grant an oath. Or even a contract uh, with the government. Um, it seems to me what you're getting at is, and I I, I imagine there's lots of uh, analysis of, of Jesus's comments there, which I'm, I'm familiar with. But I would assume he's against oaths because oaths typically show allegiance to some kind of authority, and that gets close to um, having a false god, right? Like you should only worship God. You shouldn't worship the state or the king. So I I would imagine that the prohibition on oaths has something to do with that. I don't know. It's just it's just a guess. But um, I don't really know the clear distinction between making an oath and just saying yes or no. I mean, yes or no could be a contract. And contracts are different than oaths, I would think. But I, I mean, the standard libertarian idea is that the state exists. It's criminal, but the reason it exists is because you know, it's the rule of the majority by the minority. How does the minority get away with it? They get away with it because they basically have the majority convinced of their authority and their legitimacy. And they do this from a variety of ways, right? They bribe them, they, they, they brainwash them, they propagandize them. And, you know, they get them to say the Pledge of Allegiance, which is like an oath, and lawyers have to take an oath, and uh, everyone has a start treating the constitution as this thing of and then even the social contract idea is a little bit sneaks this in because even if you're not a congressman or a politician or a lawyer or a doctor they they say that you've taken an oath to the constitution even though you never did right because by living here you agreed to live under the constitution and they make you say the pledge of allegiance so they sort of ingrain in everyone this idea that we all have this obligation or duty to the constitution and thus to the state Totally. So I think that's one that's one way they that the government or the state maintains control and keeps the population docile and following their orders. 
Um, I suppose you could bring in um, this idea of oaths as part of the description of what goes on there, and maybe Jesus had some wise things to say about the danger of oaths that you could uh, you could build on in that analysis. But that's that's all I know about that. Okay. Um, I also want to point out that later on in the book of James, um, so James is uh, talking about what Jesus has said, and he says, "Remember, brothers, above all, swear no oaths." So this no oaths uh, commandment is like so central to me. It's basically like the number one commandment of Jesus, besides like uh, uh, you know the, the sort of the key sacraments or something. It, it, at least the uh, really concrete commandment of Jesus to swear no oaths. And to me, that's just so, so political. Well, I mean, I, I suppose, I mean, I, I think it, it seems at least compatible with the libertarian uh, distrust of the state. I mean, we don't think that people should be allegiant to the state, and we don't have any allegiance to the state, and we shouldn't treat the state like God, uh, which they want us to do, right? Um, and maybe Jesus was giving something similar. I mean, there are there are decent libertarian arguments, like you said earlier, that Jesus was an anarchist. There's a guy named James Redford who has an article. Jesus is an anarcho-capitalist, and I think the fact that Jesus speaks in monarchist language and has a theological conception of this uh, hierarchy of power in the spiritual realm doesn't contradict the possibility that his secular thinking is compatible with with private law and anarchy. I mean, even the idea of render under Caesar would would not mean taking an oath. It just means hand your money over if it's his money, right? That's like a yes or no thing. So that's that would be, you know, saying comply with the state if you have to, but you don't have to re recognize it as having any authority. I uh, have a novel take on the render under Caesar. Um, I I believe, yeah, like render under Caesar. What is Caesar's? basically means you weren't supposed to have the money in the first place because it wasn't yours or it wasn't uh I, that's just it's, it's not really my only take but this is just mm -hmm. one take have you have you ever heard of this guy called daniel suelo no he's uh sort of called the man who lived without money there's a book about him but he still lives in in utah and he like lived uh most of his life without money but he lived very he as he likes to say abundantly um, and he, uh, he, he actually got me rolling on a lot of these ideas. Um, I'm sure you're totally aware that, uh, or I, I assume you're aware that just from what I've been talking about that, like, uh, the vast majority of Christians do not interpret that passage the way I'm interpreting it. Oh, right? sure. Sure. But some, some libertarians uh, interpret it similarly to what you've said from what I, Oh, yeah. Heard. Um, <clears throat> and as for this guy that lived without money, look, either he is living like a hermit, self sufficient, which in which I mean, money is only applicable in a bar, in, in an advanced beyond post barter society. Uh, so, I, and I don't see how you can live abundantly if you live a hand to mouth existence on your own. So, my guess is he was doing like what the Soviet Union did in, in, when, in the height of the cold war where, where they were they had fake prices but they could copy the prices of the west right to have some semblance of rational economic calculation so this guy probably was trading and bartering with people from the outside world which had a, a, an abundance of goods to trade with them because of the money system so it's probably a little hypocritical to run around it's like these guys that did like i lived i lived on bitcoin only for a year so all that means was they just converted dollars to Bitcoin every time they were going to make a purchase. Yeah, they, you know, no, really no, he, uh, yeah, well, yeah, he actually had never touched money um, for the time while he was. Uh, well, did, he, did like he trade? Did he trade with anyone? Did he? No, he he also he also um, he is also against all forms of barter. Yeah, he he says yeah, that. So, it, so uh, he so it's not about money. He's just a hermit. Like I said, he's just living hand to mouth on his own reserve somewhere yeah yeah he mostly lives in, lives in caves and stuff yeah but you don't live in, that's not abundance man come on uh he calls it a spiritual abundance so i mean <laughs> yeah well you could you know you can call a horse a chicken but you can't you can't uh, uh 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Call things whatever you want, but if we're speaking in language that has meanings, abundance usually has a meaning. So yeah. it's just it's a way of saying I don't have material abundance, but I have spiritual abundance. Like congratulations, but then, then that's, so, that's a, it's equivocation because you're trying to tell people they can have abundance, but you're appealing to their common sense understanding of it. And then you do a bait and switch on them and say, well, and then they, you know they're poor and starving. And you say, well, but you have material abundance. It's like, I mean, a spiritual abundance. I don't know. I don't know the story. Yeah. I'm just guessing. Yeah, yeah. Um, some interesting, yeah, takes there. But um, if Jesus is really that smart, he wouldn't be against money. Put it that way. <laughs> I mean, the idiots in Star Trek universe might say they don't need money, but Jesus would know that we need money in a world of scarcity. No. Oh, yeah. I'm very anti-money. Um, so like Suelo, he he has all these um, writings. He, he says that basically all the world religions agree on one thing, and it's that um, they're against usury. And to him, money is inherently usurious. And so therefore money is um, because money is um, is like math beyond what is nat in the natural world and anything beyond the natural equation is user is us usurious any kind of interest um that, that could be I, but there's there's nothing wrong with usury i mean the, the problem there is <coughs> it's just it's just basically some kind of proto-marxian confused economics um i mean this guy seems like he's consistent he's not trading at all because if you're against money you should be against all social interaction whatsoever because you should be against all trade you should get be, you should be against barter as well as money i mean money doesn't so, add anything money just makes trade more efficient he advocates for what's called gift economy where whereas you you only um give away freely and receive freely i don't want to talk i don't want to get into him too much but um yeah he he inspired me on a lot of these topics and i think he has a lot of uh good content if you ever want to um look at it daniel suelo um he's like he's one of the uh links that like uh schizo people like to link up on on like 4chan um <laughs> he's like really out there but i think a lot of it um at its core is like super good but I mean, how are you gonna how are you gonna read this guy? Are you gonna read a book he wrote, read his writing on the internet, all these yeah, things that came about life. because of the capitalist monetary system. Right. So if he had his way, no one would read him and no one would know <laughs> what he's talking about. So it's hypocritical. He to only uses criticize free, the but he only uses freely given things. So he only uses like computers at at, the, at libraries. Um and uh yeah, I mean he 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 really has his whole his whole ideology um, worked out. Uh, so, sounds like it'll spread. It sounds like it'll spread like wildfire among the youth. <laughs> uh, so, so I guess so. Here's what, what my sort of main question to you um, is: so I, uh, so you identify as a libertarian. Um, I, more so, at least on this earth, consider myself an anarchist. Well, I think I think um, consistent libertarians are anarchists. So I think that, uh, oh. and, and a consistent anarchist is libertarian. So I, I, I mean, li to me, libertarian <coughs> just means the opposition to aggression. And if you take that consistently, then you have to recognize all states are criminal, so you oppose all states. So, so, okay. So to mean, me, libertarian I, means anarchist. Okay. Sorry, I wasn't. I'm not totally familiar with all, your, all of your work. Um, so you may you may have. Well, it's not just me. This is li so libertarianism. Libertarians include people that are for radically, uh, radically uh, small government. We call those guys minarchists. They live in the minimal state, and people that think there should be no state, like anarchists. And we, I'm, a, I'm an anarchist, and the anarchist libertarians think that. The Minicus libertarians are inconsistent and not quite fully perfect libertarians, but they're close enough that we include them in the label. Hmm. And they would say the opposite. The Minicus would say that anarchists really don't support liberty because their system liberty would be destroyed, so they don't count us as libertarians. So we're kind of fighting over the term. Um, so are you – are you? Uh, so to me, what what – I'm assuming so. You're you're cool with contracts, right? Understood in, in the Rothbardian sense, yes. 
which is, which is that contracts are not agreements or binding agreements. They are simply um, transfers of title or transfers of owned property from one person to another by his expressed consent. So a contract is the transfer of ownership from it's, it's basically a trade or, or the change of ownership from one thing to another. It's not a binding promise or a binding agreement, <clears throat> which is how the law classifies it. But the Rothbardian and the libertarian uh, conception of it, the Austrian libertarian conception of it is, as I just said, is, is a title transfer theory. OK, so and it's um, just by the way, and that's just the, that's because libertarianism essentially is a property theory. It believes that there are private property rights. Every human being is the owner of certain things determined by the homesteading rule, like who had it first and contract, like who transferred it, which did you get it from a previous owner? So <clears throat> contract is just the exercise of ownership by an owner of a thing. It's the decision to transfer it to someone else. So like if you own something, you can let someone use it or you can deny them the use of it, like your home or your car or your body. So within your conception of contracts or your ideal contract system, um, are there elevated third parties or however you want to call, call them? Is there is, is there a, a state? Is there an enforcer? Oh, well… You can't have a libertarian system unless the libertarian norms are widely agreed upon in society and respected, which means property rules. So basically <clears throat> to achieve the society, you have to have a wide agreement on the, the just basis of, of ownership. And yeah, so of course you could have um, institutional assistance in enforcing your property rights if you need it. Um, which we do now. I mean, I, I think of today the Western societies as as quasi libertarian because uh, the private law that exists and is enforced that evolved from the Roman law and then the, the English common law is roughly libertarian because it roughly recognizes property based upon those principles like first use and contract. There's lots of exceptions because the state has mangled it and we've had bad economics informing judges, but roughly they're they're roughly libertarian. They're just not perfectly consistent. But yeah, you can have you can have people you, like if uh, if you have a contract and someone and uh, the contract specifies that you own this thing and, as opposed to someone else, and then they refuse to hand over the money they owe you <coughs> or the thing or whatever, and uh, they refuse to cooperate, then you could have dispute resolution. That could be an arbitral tribunal or a court or an insurance company, something like that. Mm -hmm. So, to me. You're then, since there's any kind of elevation, you're recreating the state, and then like according to like Pornell's law, over a long enough timeline, basically that bureaucratic mechanism will overtake the uh, entire society. And well, I, it, I don't think so. But if, if even if that was true, the alternative would be to have just no law and like have everyone always engage in self-help and then get rid of obliterate the idea of ownership and property rules and norms, and everything just comes down to possession and the strong and the strong win and and might makes right and that's a world of not that's not a world of humanity that's a world how animals live. Um, in fact, even animals have some norms. You know, if you, if one dog is eating at its bowl, he growls if you approach it. You know, he knows it's his bowl. Um, so I, I think that um, – and I don't think it is like the state because the state is specifically – that's why definitions are important, like this oath term. You can't just throw it around there. You have to be precise and rigorous about it if you want to well, include it oath, in any oath, analysis. Oath, like he says, oath is anything above binary yes or no. I don't know what above means, and I don't know what yes or no means. Do you mean yes or no means consent, a prediction, an agreement? Uh, what is it even? That's that's just not that's just not rigorous is all I'm saying. I mean, you, maybe you can make it rigorous, but uh, that doesn't seem rigorous to me as you stated it. <clears throat> and the state is an institution or an agency that claims a, a monopoly on the provision of justice in a given region. That's what the state is, and that's where all its evils come from. From that characteristic of having this monopoly, how it gets the monopoly is. An interesting and a different question. It gets it because 
it emerges over time and people get used to it and then the state successfully uses some of its resources to propagandize people nowadays by public schooling and manipulation of you know uh, or control of the of the of the airwaves through the fcc <coughs> but it's its nature is that it has a monopoly and once it has a monopoly it's going to be inefficient and it's going to make decisions in its own favor that's just natural uh, that means it will become large and powerful and unjust and inefficient. Uh, but that doesn't that logic doesn't apply to a decentralized arbitral tribunal that we two two parties to a dispute voluntarily call upon. You know, it'd be like if, if I go to a doctor because I have a broken arm, it doesn't mean that I've caused the state to emerge because I've given a, a doctor, a specialist. The, the role of helping me in a narrow area of my life. He's a specialist, it's a division of labor. And likewise, if two people have a dispute and they want to solve things peacefully and they can't come to an agreement on their own, they would go to a mediator, a third party. Just like if a, a husband and wife have a problem, they might go to a marriage counselor. You know, If a husband and wife go to a marriage counselor, I don't see how that creates a state and sets the Portnell's iron law of bureaucracy in motion. Well, if he is an oath-based, <laughs> in an oath-based position, potentially. But again, that's why it's, 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 I don't know what it means to say he's an oath-based position. But in any case, I don't see how going to an, an arbitrator is an oath-based position. It's simply we both agree to abide by the decision of a neutral third party, and when he makes his decision, then either we agree with it or we don't. And if we don't, Either there's an enforcement mechanism to make us comply with it, or there's not. And I think there might not be. It might just be a totally reputational thing. You know, someone who is known to disregard the edicts of a neutral third party dispute resolution system will tend to find people won't deal with him because they know that he's not trustworthy. So I tend to think ostracism and reputational effects and the inability to get insurance coverage will tend to drive out people that are that are recalcitrant and stubborn and not cooperative and people that don't have a tendency to uh, seek you know to compromise and try to find a resolution of disputes but this is the natural way of things um, and of course in a more in a richer and a more advanced society you could expect that to be done more and more efficiently <laughs> with a larger society more wealth more specialization like more lawyers more 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 dispute tri tribunals uh, more reputational agencies and systems, all this would get better and better. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, um, we're past the 30 minutes. Would you be willing to talk I've got a little more? bit more. I've got a little bit more time. Go ahead. Great. So um, I have a couple of questions that I wrote, but they're not necessarily, uh, that it don't necessarily follow exactly with where we were. But um, so uh, would your, ideal system necessarily and be able to uh, interface with a uh, uni uniform commercial code? Mm -hmm. uh, I detect something there, but let, let me, let me guess at that. Uh, <laughs> do you have some kind of, uh, do you have some kind of uh, idiosyncratic uh, problem with the U UCC? Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's what I thought. I, I've seen this this before. Um, first of all, I don't have a, I, I'm an I'm an anarchist, so I don't have an ideal system. Um, anarchists are not for this. Is the problem with, with well, status? This is the problem with status. I, I, they'll they'll uh -huh. say like, well, I don't think your system would work. Like like as if I'm proposing a system. I'm not proposing a system. Um, I'm simply opposed to aggression in human affairs, and I recognize that the state. That we have now, and any state that could possibly exist because of its nature, would commit aggression, and therefore it's it's unjust and it's wrong. That's all. Um, <clears throat> and I would be I'd be, I'd prefer people not to engage in aggression. And if people didn't engage in aggression, we would have a society where there was no aggression, or at least there was no institutionalized aggression. You still might have occasional random private acts of crime or aggression, and they would be dealt with in the, the predictable ways, you know, by self defense and by and by justice, <laughs> uh, sometimes vigilante justice, sometimes institutional. You know, uh, but uh, so the the society, I the system I'm in favor of is just a system where 
there's no institutional aggression and there's no institutional aggression because most people recognize that it's wrong. They don't recognize that now because although they oppose aggression more or less, they're confused about the nature of the state. They, they bought into the myth that the state is necessary and the state is good and the state is essential, and although it's imperfect, it's better than the alternative, which is anarchy. That's what they've been told, and they believe that, so they're, they're, they're sort of confused. Um, <clears throat> so I think in that kind of system, private law would emerge naturally, and there would be a role for codes because over time, you know, people are going to want to know in this region what is the law. <laughs> and so some, some lawyer or some company might publish a book. This is the private marriage law or family law or, or contract law or commercial law or property law or criminal law or evidence law or procedural law in this region. And people would buy the book because they want to know what the law is. And then over time, you know, different different advances of the law would happen because of uh, custom and tradition and practices and contracts, and the law would finally you know keep developing, and there would be a need for treatises and codes. Now, the Uniform Commercial Code <coughs> is one of those types of hybrid codes that we have in society now, but it's not exactly the type of code I'm talking about. The type of code I'm talking about would be a compilation of existing law, and hopefully that law would be mostly libertarian and just, so you just codify and compile it so people could understand it. That's what legal scholars would do. The UCC was really a draft at sort of summarizing the existing common law, but then putting it in form of a statute so the legislature could enact it as a statute. In, in my system, there's no such thing as a statute or legislation for two reasons. Number one, there's no state, so there's no legislature, so it's impossible to have statutes and legislation, <clears throat> which is a good thing because legislation is not a way to make law. Legislation is just a way to implement the will of the ruling authority. By, by making it pass under the banner of law and pretend like it's law, just like in the US in the federal court system, all these guys that are, they call judges, the federal judges, the Supreme Court judges, they're not really judges. They're just state agents whose job is to interpret the words written down on paper by other state agents. That's it. Their job is not to do justice, which is what, the, what a real judge does. A real judge tries to resolve a dispute between two parties based upon principles of justice and fairness. Hmm. These federal judges can't do that because their job is to interpret the constitution of federal law, which are just positive enactments written down on paper by a bunch of elected bureaucrats and members of the state. So I don't think they're actual judges. They're not actually doing law. What they're interpreting is not law. And so mm. the UCC is just another example of legislation, although it was based in part on codified common law principles. So its substance is not completely horrible. It's actually kind of beautiful. Now, t tell me what your concern with the UCC is. Roman Catholic um, Church conspiracy lizards or what? No, I just I just have sort of this basic. Um, so from what I understand, it you know came from like Babylon. Um, so basically, I'm into this thing of like yeah, like uh, so like the Jews they like went to Babylon, they were exiled, and then they like got all these bad habits, uh, like um, like uh, essentially you know the the uh, com the commercial commercial uh well, the rules of the ucc and uh basically that it's like an oath-based uh again with the oath-based thing i don't know <laughs> you need to what do you mean by oath what is an oath so an oath is it like a solemn uh, commitment pledging allegiance to someone what what is an oath so an oath is an elevation of your word beyond um beyond where it like uh I'm not, I'm not that good at legalese, but um, it's not legalese. Yeah. This is just it's not legalese. It's, this is I think it, it, the problem you're having is this is all metaphorical stuff, and it's just not rigorous and crisp. And, and it, you see, when you say it's an elevation of a word beyond something, I think you're thinking in mystical terms. Uh huh. Because you, you're imagining like words have power, probably with a capital P. You know, <laughs> right? Sort of. I mean. Yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah. trying to reconcile 
what I see here in in the Bible, and apparently this, you know, big important guy called Jesus said, said something that sounds super anarchic to me. Whereas, like 99.9% .9 of pastors and church people, they will not acknowledge. They'll actually go the opposite on this verse. They'll say, actually, it means take take oaths and take them seriously. Literally, everyone thinks that, even though it said he says take no oaths at all. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah because they, they do. I mean, I think some people might look commonsensically. I think what it is, is most people. Yeah, there's probably a mystical religious element to it. But most people, even religious people, believe that, you know, honesty is important and your word is important, like just because of your reputation. So if the government asks you to swear to something. You shouldn't lie. And so if it is a lie, you shouldn't do it. Right. Uh, um, <clears throat> and I believe if I understand in some courts like. They can't. They don't. We don't. They don't make you swear on the Bible, like to, to be a witness. They give you an alternative, like instead of a swear, you can affirm. You can right. affirm or something. So th they they do tend to make an exception because apparently some people have a problem with that. But I always thought it was just because it, it's against people's religious idea where they hold God as their highest authority to put some something else above that. And I appreciate that. I think religion, although I think is is in a sense nonsense is is a useful uh institutional hedge against state power i mean you know um but like let, let's let's take your take a, a typical marriage between a man and a woman i view that as a, a commitment a committed relationship now if you have a loosey-goosey vague concept of oath you could call that an oath you know i took an oath to my wife but that's because most people just use the word as a synonym for promise I know I, I love I love this uh, I love how weddings uh, work into this because yeah it's not an oath at least the <laughs> traditional ceremony the oath is when you go to the uh, courthouse afterwards but at the actual wedding ceremony they ask you do you blah 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 take blah 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 and you yeah. just say yes or no it's within the no, binary yeah yeah but yeah but, yeah but you're saying you're you're, pro you're making a promise you're making a commitment you're you're, you're promising to be committed to this person to the end of your life. That's what you're promising. You're making no, an effort. You're making a commitment. I, it depends on the wording of the, um, but that's what a marriage, I don't care about the wording. It's what a marriage is. A marriage is a committed relationship. No, that's, cause there's a difference. Because, a woman doesn't want to have babies with a man that she thinks is going to run off. He, she needs to have someone who promises to stick with her. She believes it. So, so, so like I, I consider myself a Christian. So like, so in terms of uh, Jesus' words there, I do not want to make any promises because – so and anything beyond a binary is uh, – you could call it a promise, but to me it's not a promise. Like if I say yes – Well, I, I I'll wouldn't go even your... – even where promise to me – promises – so people use the word promise to mean a contract, and I, like I said, I don't, I don't agree contracts should be viewed as binding promises. They might come from a promise. Like I might say, I promise to deliver these goods to you tomorrow, and we take the underlying meaning of that to mean I'm transferring these goods to you tomorrow. <clears throat> but it's not really a binding promise. It's just the way we interpret language. Likewise, you know, I mean, are you saying you've never told your significant other, look, I promise I'll never do that again? <laughs> you've never said the word promise before? Is the word right. promise now an anathema? Right, totally. Yeah, once I realized what these passages say, I, so you, I you promise you do promise it. You you promising as an oath. Absolutely, exactly. So, so so if your wife says, "Do you promise not to not to uh, do the following?" and you say yes, that's okay because you just said yes. Uh, I mean, you see, it's it's a cheat because no, you're saying yes. No, no, no. To the I would tell about her, a promise. No, I don't promise, but I'll give my word because see, word. Well, what's is, the, what's it, the difference between word and promise? So, you it's know, word, word, I mean, in, you know, in the Bible, it says in the beginning, there was the word. Well, the word that's God. God the word, the word means God. the Holy Spirit. That means the logos of God. Right. It means some yeah. supernatural spiritual thing. You're not a, you're not you're not comparing your utterances to your wife, to the holy divinity of God, are you? Well, our words are, in a sense, divine. <laughs> so be going beyond our word, it's it's like a. Uh, Beyond your promise, you mean? See, you mean your I promise? Mean, are you are you just saying be honest? Is that what you mean? 
Yeah, I mean, absolutely be honest. Okay, so, so but... it needs to be honest about your intentions. So if you say, honey, I have not cheated on you, and I don't intend to, and I don't think mm -hmm. I ever will, and I, mm -hmm. I, I give you my oath to – to never try. I mean, no. It's like you're trying to skirt around by semantics saying some magic bad words. Yeah, you just don't elevate beyond your word. Just yes or no. I mean, just. Uh, so if your wife says, will you ever cheat on me? What would you say? Well, I mean, it depends on if I'm going to say yes or no, I guess. But uh, <laughs> um, I'm just going to say yes or no. I mean, I. Okay, well, let's say you say you no, and then the, uh, say you say no, and then you cheat on her the next month. Uh -huh. What does that mean? What does that mean? What have you violated? My word. But your word was just a prediction, because you don't mm -hmm. want to make a promise. No, it's it not wasn't. a promise. That, if it's not a promise, then you didn't violate it. It's about congruence, um, which also I find is a very like mystical concept, like that the alpha needs to be congruent you, you um, ever seen, have you ever seen true. do you know much about math no i'm not i'm not a math guy. <laughs> well what do you what do you get if you divide one by zero in your calculator you uh, ever tried that? it explodes yeah. yeah and you know why <laughs> why because it's undefined and do you know why uh, because because you can't divide by zero right 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 and if and you have an equation with a bunch of x's and y's and there might be like if you have x plus y at the bottom and if x and y are the same, that's a zero, but you might not know it. You might not notice it, right? So you're doing this equation. All of a sudden, you get these crazy results. Mm -hmm. And if you trace it back, you find out, oh, the reason I'm getting this crazy result is because I made a mistake. The mistake was I did a divide by zero on accident, right? Because at this point in the equation, the x and the y were actually the same. That meant the denominator was zero, So, and I didn't realize it, whatever. Well, I see an analogy to that to speaking in, in vague, slippery, metaphorical, mystical language. Like if you don't – if you're not rigorous and careful and precise with your language and have clear definitions and make sure you're not using things in multiple ways, which leads to equivocation, <clears throat> then you can prove anything. I mean you know, you could say that, well, the word is this, and therefore – you know. It's just it's just not it's not rational rigorous analysis. You basically can use that kind of mumbo jumbo. That this no, is not, to, no, I'm not I'm not being critical of you. I'm just I'm giving you my kind of anti my 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 own prejudice against slippery language. Against what? language that is not clear and solid and rigorous. Yes, because it just leads to it's the opposite. You, the the legalese language is slippery, and there's so many ways you could look at it. Whereas the word based, just simple. Well, I'm talking simple. more. Ph I'm talking more philosophy and rigorous thought than, than legalese. I mean, I'm not. I, I, I'm talking about just when you have rational discourse, you need to, especially when the terms matter a lot. Like when you start talking about like this oath, a lot in your theory hinges upon whether mm -hmm. something's an oath or not. So it's important to be clear about what you mean by it. And I guess, I guess my original assumption was right. You do mean a broad thing by it. So you mean promises too. Totally. So yeah. I, I don't see how that makes you hate the UCC, but except it's got something to do with Babylon. <laughs> but I mean, you know, the original code was the code of Hammurabi. It was one of the oldest ones we know of. And then you had, you know, you had the twelve, the twelve tables and you had you had the ten the decalogue, you know, the Ten Commandments. You've had lots of codes. You, then you had the Corpus Juris Civilis of uh, you, you had the the, uh, the, the institutes of, of Justinian Roman law, Blackstone's codes. Uh -huh. um, I, I I mean I I think that my I, I'll put it this way: the Rothbard Kinsella whatever you want to call it theory of contract is probably compatible with your hostility to oaths and promising because it doesn't involve promising; it's only a yes or a no. It's like yeah. Do you do you transfer do you transfer ownership of this thing that you own to someone else? Yes. You know, mm -hmm. that's basically what contracts are in my view. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> yeah. But, but I don't see what you would have against codes in general because it's just a way of setting down in an organized form oh, a, no, body no, I'm of, not... a body of principles. Yeah, I'm actually not – I mean I'm not against it itself. I'm against adhering to it in the form of – in, in, 
in the in the way that you must conform with it for other people to be able to conform with to it with you so if you want to do business with another country like nigeria that conforms to ucc you need to do all these you need to sign all these things i mean signing something to me is an oath um it's a beyond a uh it's beyond a yes or a no actually i'm not totally sure on i'm not totally sure yet on uh simple signings whether i consider that beyond well yeah because signing is just a way of documenting things and, and getting proof later so it's proof of people's consent consent uh -huh. is not always an oath <laughs> yeah yeah you know, like, not... so let's let's say let's say you're gonna have surgery and the doctor's gonna you know knock you out and cut you open uh-huh he doesn't want you to wake up and sue him for assault and battery right Mm -hmm. But you could you could say, oh, you cut me open, <laughs> you you're a butcher, and and his his defense would be, no, you consented to it, and you say I didn't consent. <laughs> so how's right. he going to prove that you well, consented? He says, oh well, well, you signed a piece of paper right before I put you to sleep that says I consent, so I have evidence. Yeah. So so see you're so I think it's it's all you shouldn't have uh, entered into the oath based system at all. I mean, you're probably dealing with the oath based <laughs> doctor. Uh, a doctor who's you know taking an oath who's like i'm submitting himself to this bureaucracy and this bureaucracy changes like crazy i mean yeah but nothing in my, nothing in my hypothetical requires the doctor to be this could be a private free market doctor where there's no such thing as the ama no such thing as medical licensing i mean in, in, a, in an anarchist private society that you okay. would still have doctors and they don't want to get sued uh sued assumes that there's a, a a system that allows for such a thing well it's not and there would be but even if there wasn't the doctor doesn't want to get a reputation for running around butchering people and operating on them without their consent he wants to have a good reputation so he doesn't want someone to be able to make an unsubstantiated claim that he performed a surgery without consent of the patient so it would be mm -hmm. natural for him to get them to sign on the dotted line giving him con uh, permission to do the operation uh, i mean surely god can't be against using ink to put markings on paper no i mean the I mean, bible itself is written down wasn't it yeah um so you can put information on paper that's all for sure a, sig a signature is information the information is that i read this and i was aware of what it says yeah <laughs> And here's yeah. proof of that. You know? Yeah, I'm. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out. I mean, for the past like fucking or like five, ten years, I've been trying to figure out exactly what is uh, an oath and and what it what's beyond the yes or the no, and and it's tricky. And I'm having a tough time, as you can. Well, understand. you could be ha you could be. Uh... You could be doing what I did when I tried to prove an ultra property or when I tried to prove that there was a God. I mean, you could be butting your head against the wall because it's just – I mean you chose a battle that's just – basically but, but, you think you think Jesus had some, some deep words about oaths in one of mm -hmm. his brief statements, and mm -hmm. you think you need to unpack it and apply it to life in general or something. Because I realized – because my life was not is not as a as a millennial my life you know in many ways is not as good as it was you know uh, portrayed to me that it was going to be and i'm like holy shit every holy shit the book that they gave me that they were like okay well whatever you do like follow this guy and what he says and i looked at what that guy said and he said no oaths and then i realized the whole world is totally replete with oaths so those everywhere every day yeah but don't don't you think i mean if you really want to put so much importance on the word oath in the english version of some protestant translation mm -hmm. of an ancient text that you would actually want to study like what were the actual words in the original aramaic or greek or whatever it was in in that, in that actual chapter what was the I mean, I mean, maybe it's not I, maybe it's not I, even the word oath maybe it's the word I don't know. Maybe it's some other word. Maybe that's just I, the way the translator translated it. Have you have you have you looked at other translations? Do they all yes. use the word oath? Yes. Uh, yes. I look at. I've I've read quite a lot on this subject. I mean, not everything, but quite a bit. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and also, uh, 
I mean, getting more into crazy stuff, I realized that, wait, like all my family members are the male ones. They were all Freemasons. And that's an oath-based system. <laughs> it's an oath-based system, right? Yeah. Yeah. So why, why the heck? All these people who I feel screwed me over, people screwed me over, they're all like oath nuts. They fucking love oaths. They'll take any oath you give them. Oath, oath, oath. And then I'm like, well, this guy says, Jesus says no oaths. And I'm like, okay, there's something to this. And then I've like, my brain has been stuck on it for so like, like years so now. like oath, oath keepers drives you insane. <laughs> in a in a sense, but I mean, uh, Stuart Rhodes apparently was a, like a FBI informant, so I don't know how real that organization even was. But um, they shouldn't have taken the oath in the first place. Is my is my argument right now, at least. So, like, one of your favorite songs would be uh, that one, um, I Beg Your Pardon, I Never Promised You a Rose Garden. Uh, I, don't, I don't know the song, but... Uh, really? But, uh, I yeah. beg your I... pardon. <laughs> a little country music there. Yeah. Yeah, so, so your, your whole thesis would be stop, stop making promises. <laughs> Yeah, just uh, stop. Stop. Everyone, making, stop making promises. Yeah, stop making these elevated. Let's just keep things simple on our word. And uh, so, 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 I think the Amish uh, interpret it this way, the way I, the way I do. They think that he literally says no oaths. But here's the weird thing: they have in like their whole society. So like they don't sign. Uh, from what I understand, I'm not okay. I'm not sure if they sign simple contracts for things like uh, building someone a building or something, but um, I should know that. But uh, they, they, the problem, the main problem with the Amish is they swear an oath to their church, um, which I think is like, yeah, it's uh, it's where they where they mess up there. Um, so, so what do you think? Do you know that some of these libertarian groups, like I think the libertarian party and maybe um <coughs> well let's take the libertarian party i think that you have to you have to agree to this non-aggression oath or principle like you have to you have to say something like i hereby forswear the use of aggression in human affairs or something like that to become a, a good member and yeah kind of like kind of like an ayn rand's uh, atlas shrugged um um before you enter, before you enter uh, the building where his magic electricity machine was housed, it had a pass. It had a special electronic sort of password system where you had to state this oath to get in. Like I promise, I will not live my life for someone else. Or make, uh -huh. expect. I guess you're against all that too. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Well, yeah. what 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 if what if the you want to join the Libertarian Party and they say, well, we only accept Libertarians? Are you a Libertarian? If it's a yes or no, is that okay? Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, yes. <laughs> uh, but I don't think it would be, um, because yeah, all these organizations they all want you. Uh, they don't like they don't like the the simple language the yes or the no they all they all want things to be super official and they all want things to conform with the UCC and blah 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 and uh, I just want to like live simple li like like a simple life almost like Daniel Suelo. Yeah, uh, I can tell. I mean, so you're not you're for simplicity. I don't see why simplicity is per se a good thing. By the way, we're using Zoom right now. I assume you had to sign the terms and conditions to get the software. Um. As you might assume, I pay extra careful attention to things like that. And no, I didn't. <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't see it anywhere. But um, I'm sure it was tucked in somewhere, or it is tucked in somewhere. Um, yeah. So what, I mean, I understand being disillusioned with the world that millennial the millennial generation is faced with in some ways, but yeah, I, I just don't. I mean, I, to, uh, unless you link it in closely with the theory of the state. I don't see how oaths themselves are the root source of the problem. Although I can see how it is like a widespread phenomena of of so, 
people being basically coerced or induced or forced to to give some kind of allegiance to different institutions that are all linked up with the state. I, I, I could agree with that to some extent. Yeah. But I don't think that's really the root cause of it. I think that's just that's the way that that's it the way that people's the, the way people are brainwashed to believe the state is good. That's the way it manifests itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and the oaths, they open the door for the bad things to happen. Without that opening, then so much. Ba basically, you need oaths for things to scale. You can't. And, and the thing is, scaling, uh, scaling naturally, I think is fine. Like if you're Amish or whatever Mormon, and you have to make a big family naturally, and that's cool. But what they want, what most people want to do is they want to like, commit usury in the sense that they want like a, a uh, what the curve, what's it called? The curve that just like goes straight up hockey stick. They want a hockey stick. And the way, the only way you get, you get hockey sticks is if you include oaths and things. At least, well, at least know, sustainably. I, well, you know, like there's, there's a cool, you might like this article. It's by Alfred, Alfred Kuzan. It was like in the first issue of the journal of libertarian studies. It's called, do we ever really got to get out of anarchy? And his argument is that even in today's world, we still have anarchy of a type because like even if the state itself is internally in a type of anarchy because the, the leaders of that state, like the president, you don't have direct control and coercive power over all your underlings. They just obey your orders because it's part of the hierarchy, part of their order. Yeah, and maybe oaths play a role in that like because they're expected to do it. Right? <clears throat> it could be that you couldn't get someone to go bomb innocent you know innocent people in cambodia on your orders if they didn't have an oath that they felt they had to abide by like maybe the, you know maybe you wouldn't have the i was just following orders uh yeah ex exactly exactly yeah I, yeah i think oaths are a powerful psychological mechanism that get people to do things that they otherwise wouldn't but but this 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 dislike of usury makes no sense to me, and this seems to be totally like well, a side well, thing. My, mm -hmm. And the problem is that that's used by states as an excuse to regulate commercial affairs, so it's used as an authority to commit aggression, um, or it's used as an excuse it's, – it's used for hostility towards a, an advanced commercial capitalist society, like, oh, we can't have a contract and enforcement system because they will might enforce con a loan contract which have usury. Um, I, let me guess. You're you're against bigness and capitalism too. No, no. As long as it's all, as long as it's just word based. I mean, you just, I can go catch a fish, and then I can go sell it to someone. And uh, as long as I'm not like signing a contract or taking something. But I mean, you're not going to have your. You're going to have your nice, simple, Walden style life. On capitalism, you're going to be a cog in the wheel and division of labor, and buy your trout from the supermarket. You know. Yeah, yeah. I'm. What I'm Get figuring money. out is. Yeah, what I'm figuring out is if I'm gonna like take this verse seriously and take the no oath thing seriously. Yeah, you basically are screwed in terms of having the comfy life, which is exactly what Jesus says is going to happen. He says, you know, uh, it's good. It, it, it's the hard way. It's the narrow road, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I'm not saying I'm even going to necessarily do it. I mean, I still take oaths, really. Um, in, in some in interpersonal relationships, like family and friends, that's an area where I really have tried to practice this. Um, Maybe you got it backwards. Maybe the oaths you should try not to take are the ones with the state. But don't be so uptight about oaths with like your spouse or whatever or your family. Wait, I should be uptight with oaths about my family? And no, the other way around. Not be so uptight. Like, you know, nothing wrong with telling you your mom, I'll be there for you when you get on your deathbed, or I'll be there for Thanksgiving, or your wife, those, I won't Those are not you. promises. Those are, to me, the way you <coughs> phrase those is not is not above. Uh, I, know we, I know we haven't really worked on the definitions. Uh, well, even, sometimes, sometimes people, people want promises. I mean, you know, they want to say, will you be here for Christmas? Yes. Are you just making a prediction? Or are you are you going to you promise that you'll be here for Christmas? I promise. Okay, that's what they want to hear. I guess when when you elevate, you're putting something on the line. 
beyond just your yeah that's why people typical... know they can count on you that's some people want to be able to count on others <laughs> <laughs> you know there's, uh, there's, a, well, there's a utility well I mean, what if what if you go to a, okay. a what if you go to a, a, your lawyer and you tell them all your secrets and um but you don't want him you want him to have an you want him to have a, a duty of confidentiality you don't want him to to reveal your secrets to the world right that's one I mean, good thing about I going to your a psychiatrist or your doctor or a lawyer. You just that, named all oath based people, and I wouldn't talk, like be, be or a priest. You know, when you confess to a priest, you don't want the priest to tell people what your sins were. So <laughs> I think so. So you want a society where no one can trust anyone, and you can't. You're just if you have a problem, you have to deal with it all on your own. Which no, no, guess, no. So 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 yeah, you wouldn't be able to trust necessarily people. Because the society wouldn't scale, like it. it yeah, so that's why I said you're against capitalism. You need scaling. You need capitalism requires scaling. Uh, I, if you put it that way, then I guess yeah, in some sense, then I would be. But I don't necessarily think that that's the case in every. You sense. can't just have handshake deals all the time, uh, going by reputation of your first cousin. Well, you're gonna have a simple like some small yeah, Afghani gonna... village. You know, you need to have international transactions from remote parties who don't know each other, and they need to be able to count on each other's commitments. Yeah, this is. I think this is natural law. This is like within. <laughs> I don't. I mean, I don't even. You, necessarily... That's what I say. You're against. You want things to be small and localized, and yeah. I mean, I, I don't, I don't necessarily want them to be, but I just see why Jesus, as this figure, as this person who, like, you know, claims to be mystical, and he says this thing about oaths, and oaths are all around us, and he's so like, you, wait, so you don't think you should be able to go see a therapist and confide some personal things to help work out a problem? I, and be I, sure and be sure that they have an obligation not to reveal your information. You don't. You don't. Oh, think absolutely. You should be. Right. Right. I'm gonna assume, like with you, I'm totally cool. I consented to talk with you. You can use this recording <laughs> however you want. You can I know, even but I, chop yeah, it up. Yeah, but I. Yeah, but I told you I was recording it. But if you had asked me not to, and I had agreed not to, I would be then... fine with that too. Even if you recorded it and you told me, you, and I mean, if you told if you told me you weren't going to, and then you did, then I would be like okay this guy's not congruent correct correct but but that means that but that means that you, there are some things you're going to be uncomfortable being able to get help with because some things you, look if i talk to someone who i don't completely trust i know that even if they promise they're going to keep something confidential i'm going to still be careful about what i say because if they break the promise i could still get hurt if the information got out there so i'm careful about what i say but sometimes you need to be able to say those things and so you go to a very trusted person but it, you don't always have a trusted person that's, that's like your brother or something. Sometimes you have to go to a professional outsider. And in that case, you want there to be a serious institutional and relational obligation arising from a commitment not to reveal your information. And I'm thinking a priest, uh, counselors, medical doctors, psychiatrists, lawyers. I, yeah, all the. Well, your, your system, your system would basically. Get rid of all those avenues people have. It's 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 like in an, in an Amish society, nobody ever seeks out those people, right? Because it's I don't know about that. I I, I don't be, I can't believe that. I, I I can't believe that some Amish people don't on occasion use the services of a lawyer, for example, um, or a doctor. You know. Yeah, maybe they do. I of course they do, and they they expect the doctor not to go blabbing their personal details. They're, but they're, if he they're, does, they're not gonna they're not gonna sue. They don't. I'm pretty sure they're not litigious like that. They doesn't like matter. A, they're using the doctor partly on the expectation and knowing they're taking advantage of the fact that these doctors do or they're embedded in a society where they have this obligation and they're not going to violate that obligation. I mean, I think. See, to me, to my mind, you're turning something that's natural and good into something that's unnatural and bad. So that's that's where I would disagree. Although I can understand partly where you're coming from, I do think it's always better if it's natural and organic rather than uh -huh. forced. Uh -huh. But I see nothing whatsoever wrong with someone making a promise to someone else. I think you're taking the bad examples and generalizing it. So it is bad to have an oath to the state. Okay. 
I agree with you. It's bad to require lawyers to have an oath to the state to become a lawyer. It's bad for doctors to have to take certain oaths, although the Hippocratic Oath is not the worst oath I've ever heard of, right? Um, do no harm. It's changed over time. Sure. But the fact that some oaths are bad doesn't mean oath, oath making in general is bad. And maybe Jesus didn't mean that. I mean, you studied it. I haven't. I mean, you know, what he actually said is not clear because these records are not <laughs> that reliable mm. and they're not comprehensive mm. and they've been translated many times. And, yeah. you know, I, you know, maybe he, maybe he had some exceptions in mind. He was just talking about the, a certain case. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Possible. I wonder if there's been a book written about this, like o- oath making as the source of evil in the modern world or something. Maybe you could make an extended argument for it. Oh, I'm going to write the book. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> a lot of my life work right there. Yeah. Well, um, maybe start with an article and then that would force you to kind of carefully define your terms and right, right, see right. if you can have a flow like a thesis. Yeah. Introduction, sustained argument, conclusion. Yeah. It, it's not that the oath is bad, it's that it opens the door to bad. It's just, it makes what was not necessarily possible before possible. What could, if I make a commitment to my wife that I will be faithful to her for the rest of my life, what bad does that open the door to? Well, the way you phrase it is fine. You're just giving your word. No, it's a commitment. Yeah, but you, it's a commitment, it's a promise. No, well, uh, so, uh, uh, no, to me, that's not a promise. A promise is like, okay, if she, after that said, uh, if, uh, Stephen, do you promise? Then to me, you're elevating. That's like a second level. It's like. I don't know what you mean, but what does that mean, elevating? You used that before too. That's another thing. Yeah. I'm not clear what you mean. Elevating what to what? Beyond, you're like taking it instead of, uh, it, it's just beyond the base level of what you're saying if like if, if it's math it's like instead of one it's 1.5 power like oh more it's heavier it's greater it's beyond look look we've already established that you're not good at math so let's leave that to the side <laughs> <laughs> Fair. you might divide by zero an accident yeah i might don't do that uh, <laughs> all right I, I gotta go in a second if you have got one more topic we could do that otherwise I, I gotta run uh well yeah i appreciate your your work um i'd like to it, did you uh you you said that you consider anarchists libertarians and libertarians anarchists or something like that i i do you have an article or anything where you talk yeah, more yeah. about that? Or yeah. yeah, read my article, What Libertarianism Is. It's on my website. Okay. So libertarianism is just the consistent objection to aggression, uh, or the it's a consistent belief that aggression is unjust. Okay. Uh, and if you just open your eyes, then you will see that the state is also unjust because it commits aggression. So a natural application of that view of opposing yeah. aggression is to oppose a state. I mean, you can't if you oppose aggression, you oppose a state because it's aggression writ large. Mm-hmm. 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 It's like saying if I'm against aggression, are you against murder? Well, yeah, that's a type of aggression. And the mm-hmm. state is a type of aggression. So <clears throat> not all libertarians see that. They think the state is necessary. So you need some state. And they see that it's dangerous, so they want to put limits on it. Mm-hmm. And, and a lot of libertarians are not anarchists. Or, I'm sorry, a lot of anarchists are not libertarians, like left anarchists. I wouldn't say um, anarcho syndicalists, these types. I would say they're not true anarchists because you have to be a libertarian, meaning you have to believe in private property rights. Because if you, if you say you're an anarchist and you don't support private property rights, <coughs> excuse me, if you say you're an anarchist, and you're not a libertarian, which means you don't support private property rights, then that means that private property rights can be violated. And that's what states do. States violate property rights. So you can't you have you have no grounds for opposing the state if you're not against private property rights being violated. 
So that's why I say all non-libertarian anarchists are incoherent and all non-anarchist libertarians are inconsistent. That's okay. my view. But it's a minority view. I mean, that's but then my, liber, we're already minorities. So I'm a minority within minority within minorities. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's that's super interesting. I'm going to read that for sure. Sounds like you're even more of a minority. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm like I'm like one out of a million. You're, you sound like you're one out of three three billion. Yeah, it's difficult. There might uh, be two of you. There might be two of you in the world. Yeah, maybe. It, which is why I want to write more about what I'm thinking about. Um, I have a tough time getting anything on paper because I feel every, every like six months I feel like my ideas are way better than they were six months ago. And like, why would I ever put anything on paper? If it's just going to be so much better later on, uh, you, should, you should you should register the, the domain Oathbreakers. Oathbreakers dot com. Well, I think registering a domain is a type of oath. Yeah, I know you have to make an oath to get. I know that's that's the dilemma. That's why I said your ideas are going to spread like wildfire. Well, I I hope that at least my ideas were novel and maybe you like because I, I feel like you. I, I really no, appreciate it's interesting. The way it's you interesting. I'm just. Them. It's interesting. I'm just being. I'm being facetious. No, no, no. Because, yeah, 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 totally, totally. Yeah, but, yeah I, because yeah. I'm just saying that your ideas are going to make them hard to spread because you won't be able to yeah. sign the contracts needed to to publicize them. I mean, so it's yeah, it's sort of like there's a there's a joke in this great book by Jerome Tachili called "It Usually Begins with Ayn Rand," where he is sort of a, a a parody type accounting, sort of based in fact of of the rise of the libertarian movement. In the 60s and 70s, and he tells the story of this guy named Galambos. I don't know if you heard of Galambos. He was no. uh, he was an early crank libertarian who had this insane IP theory. Um, so mm -hmm. he believed everything came from intellectual property, and not only that, it was inalienable. Like, so even if you even if you if you're the owner of your ideas, you can't even sell them to someone because they're inalienable. <laughs> Which means that. Galambos could tell all his followers his ideas, but they couldn't go tell other people, and he couldn't even give them permission to tell them. So that's why – like, so his ideas naturally – so like some people are like, well, tell us about this Galambos. It's so great. And I said, I wish I could tell you, but if you could only hear it, you would, you would understand how great his ideas were. It's like, but you can't tell me? No, I can't tell you. So th the joke is, yeah, expect those ideas to spread like wildfire. Like it's a self-defeating doctrine. Yeah. Like it intentionally yeah. hobbles itself from being spread. Yeah, I get it. So um, I see nothing wrong. If you want to write this up, I see nothing wrong with you writing a paper and putting it on the internet or self-publishing a book on Amazon, even though if you have to click a couple of boxes. Yeah. Well, yeah, thanks a lot. Um, I appreciate yeah all, all your work and i want to dig more into it but um i just yeah i had a lot of these ideas that have been in my head for a long time and i i'm not able to talk to talk to like you know anybody uh, i got except, it yeah well, so. get your, if you get your thoughts together if you want to have another chat sometime give me a thanks. ring thanks a lot mr consola appreciate okay. it okay have, yeah, have a good day bye-bye bye-bye